good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to say there's a change to the uh, schedule for next week, uh, next Thursday's lecture, which was going to be uh, Jeff Manor from uh, Building Floor. But unfortunately, he's got a better job, so he's moved to New York and he's not coming. <laughs> uh, but no, no, he said he'd love to be here uh, with us, but he'll have to come after Christmas. So. Um, so instead, we have an engineer, structural engineer, who's going to be talking about the King's Cross Western Concourse, which is that kind of mad, slightly geodesic structure um, being built on the side of uh, King's Cross Station. So that could be interesting, if, if not totally different. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to Lucy uh, Boulevon, who um, Lucy is an architectural critic. Uh, she curates exhibitions about architecture, she organises conferences about architecture and is currently researching uh, master planning for a major new book called Master Planning Futures. Um, so Lucy also writes and has written extensively about architecture, editing magazines, journals and authoring books. Um, so I think we can say we have both an expert with us and an enthusiast on the subject, which is uh, what we need. Um, anyway, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Lucy to, um, to talk about the research that she's been doing on master planning and it kind of links quite nicely with what I think John Goodwin was talking about last week and particularly the kind of migration from the countryside to cities and new cities and the building of new cities um, which is kind of one of the major challenges maybe that the I don't want to get a bit, I'm getting a bit John Good, getting a bit down, sorry, upbeat, upbeat. It's one of the major challenges <laughs> in which we've all got to uh, engage with, and it's going to be marvellous. Um, anyway, thanks very much for coming in, Lucy. <coughs> Thank you very much, Will. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is probably my inaugural lecture at, Westmin at Westminster. Um, okay, Master Planning Futures. Well, as he has explained, it's the title of my book for Routledge, which will be coming out at the end of May. And I would say the subtitle is still in the works at the moment, but the subtitle is going to be something on the lines of um, the ideals and processes of contemporary conceptual master planning. Now, you may, you may say that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. We're still mulling it over. But what, one thing that's very clear, that it is not going to be the classic textbook. In fact, the commissioning editor said, do not, under any circumstances, write a deadly boring textbook. Um, and in fact, it would be really difficult to do so. And one reason being is that there are so few books at the moment um, from the last era that actually on master planning, if you look on Google, you'll find maybe a master planning, a book, a guide to master planning science parks in the States, or you'll find one about the American movement, new urbanism, which is a very, a very specific approach to master planning, which is not in any way uh, relevant or necessary or desirable for every particular community around the world. So I realized very early on this complete dearth of material. And I did what I always do, which is to to apply an investigative journalistic approach. And so the vast majority of the book is based on original research and interviews directly with architects and master planners. Um, it's the result of two and a half years' work. Um, and I would say that at the moment, and it's always been the case, um, everybody advocates that you have a plan or a master plan or just a simple plan. It's in the military, they have plan A. They also devise plan B, they've devised plan C. So if A doesn't work, they go to B and then they go on to C. Management consultants always say, well, you've got to have your, you know, your game plan. We, we, we feel nervous if we don't have some sort of planning tool. And um, never, you know, at the moment, it's acutely necessary to have some kind of plan because I think at the moment it's taken on a heightened significance because we are in an age of casino capitalism. There's no doubt about it. The raw forces of globalization that have been washing around the world and giving us huge great benefits in terms of technology transfer and um, a, a, let's say ability to learn things in, in a new way and uh, about different cultures and communicate. And the tsunami effects of, of markets, whatever their benefits, they're not really things to rely on, either culturally or economically. 
so um, before the economic crisis, there was this phrase, the, um, the tide of globalization lifts all boats. Now, the, it, so putting all your faith in globalization as a phenomenon, which is obviously incredibly uh, risky, the idea that you can improve everybody's lives um, um, by, this, by just having faith in the markets. Now, uh, urban planners um, have, in recent years, or urban designers have definitely had to work with a more hybrid situation of working with public money and private money. And a lot of master plans from, from the recent period have been incredibly driven by I mean, predominantly are driven by private, private investment, private backing. So, uh, but that, that uh, phrase is, I mean, it's such a poignantly useless metaphor, the idea that all the boats come out of the water and everyone's happy um, right now, because it, it doesn't deal with any of the economic, it doesn't deal with the environmental crises in the world. Um, and... Um, we have, you know, heard so many stories, seen stories, um, Japan being the most recent, which has forced a, l a lot of architects in Japan to move away from a, maybe a more introverted, abstract mode of operating into getting their hands to really getting down into the nitty gritty of community planning, talking with residents in a way that, you know, the boundaries between people have come down. And that's been a, um, a fantastic, a marvelous uh, thing to, to hear about. Um, so in these vo volatile conditions, rather than laissez-faire planning, which has been very much the norm in many societies, um, or, or its opposite being the rigidly modernist, top-down approach of the past, which um, very much often entailed rather a, pre a rather heavy kind of um, transport infrastructure, rather major kind of freeways, which we are now increasingly taking out of communities. We're retrofitting them. We're either keeping them, as in the case of James Corner Field Operations Highline in New York, or we're literally, we're taking them out of uh, waterfronts. In the case of um, uh, James Corner's project for Seattle Waterfront, which is, is, is applying that. So um, no more the narrow determinist blueprint of the past. Communities need, um, they need enabling tools, they need mechanisms, they need networks, frameworks, um, linking things together, creating new dynamic connectivities between, between hard and soft. Um, Kanhai Port City is, is one of OMA Rem Kulhaus's very new master plans for, for China. Um, we need to, let's say, have a sense of the relationship between the hard and the soft, between the built environment and green spaces. Um, and uh, we need synergistic systems. There's the softscape to go with the hardscape. We need synergistic systems that are born of um, profound level of research, fresh research, not outdated research based on outdated demographics into multiple systems, so the, you know, the, the, uh, the complex systems of the city, including tran the transport infrastructure as well, um, to get a good grasp of how robust they can be in the multimodal interdependency that they, that they have. Um, now, Urban Think Tank, who are um, a, a, a team who are based at ETH in Zurich in Switzerland, who are um, Austrian and uh, Venezuelan, actually don't believe in master planning. They are very much into urban acupuncture, into retrofitting the city, going into uh, third world environments in particular, researching, but also being commissioned by housing departments in uh, cities like Sao Paulo and working in uh, slum environments like Parisopolis. And, and finding ways to ameliorate situations in very ingenious ways that use all their architectural skills from planning to, uh, the, you know, the, just the basic art of organization. Um, and um, working with, with structural engineers to come up with, with good, good in amenities like a vertical gym, for example, which is, uh, their scheme has been quite widely publicized in the media. 
to, let's say, just allow people to have a, a community resource in a very extreme um, steep topography of some high degree of degradation, which gives them, let's say, a nodal point that's social and cultural and, and, and um, makes them feel like they've got a genuine sense of place in an environment that is actually ecologically very and uh, sust in sustainable terms, otherwise quite vulnerable and fragile. So um, we have also, um, these days, master plans, if they're any good, they actually don't go very far um, be before they actually get into public consultation. This is the rest of um, urban think tanks. Fantastic work with this aspect of urban agriculture. And urban agriculture is, is growing hugely as a, as a focus of interest among architects and urban planners from cities from ranging from Detroit to Milan to China to um, London, of course, as well, if you probably noticed um, that. So, um, so yes, so basically uh, people are going to buy into your master plan if they feel they've got a genuine sense of ownership of it in the first place. And that stems from feeling that they have a say in the process. And increasingly, they are consulted. And increasingly, they are aware that you don't just consult them in a, in a last minute desultory kind of way, that you have to really actively engage them. Um, otherwise, um, I think people are increasingly um, mil able, militaristic, and they will reject plans. Um, and uh, I think it's a, a very interesting set of tensions that exist that somehow can... I wouldn't go as far as saying that, the, that, that people need to be allowed to design urban, uh, urban uh, communities, but they need to have a buy-in into the process because if they were able to design the the, if they were asked to design the, the, the actual communities, there would be no need for architects, and that would do, the, do architects and urban designers out of a job. But I think that the, now, more than ever before, the dialogues have to be quite, quite serious ones. Um, so in my book, um, as I said, I'm exploring the ideals and processes of contemporary conceptual master planning. So I'm looking at lots of different kinds of alternative strategies for effecting radical change. Um, and so I um, interview architects about plans that they've been doing in lots of different continents and cities. And I tried in order to, um, let's say, make some structure that was meaningful, um, I came up with a whole lot of different categories. But let me just run you through, first of all, a few of the, um, the highlights, just it, some of the, the key people that are going to be featured in the book. So you probably read about Norman Foster's plan for the eco-city of Mazda City, about which I concluded that it's far too soon to evaluate it uh, on ecological performance grounds, because the first phase has only just been done. Um, which, is, which is tricky, because a lot of people are placing great faith in eco-cities as an idea. But I think we will have to go a lot further down the road before we can actually seriously uh, do that evaluation and see whether they're, they're performing as they say they will, as they are very, very keen to have high performance. So um, there's Angela Merkel at uh, Mazda City and, and Angela Merkel, the um, uh, German Prime Minister, uh, Premier, uh, once again at Mazda City. I think all the celebrities have been visiting the first phase. Very proud of what they are seeing. Um, ACOM, who are very big practice, doing quite a lot of fairly developer-driven master plans, but ACOM also have quite a conceptual agenda. Uh, they've been working on the Mushareb master plan, a district for Doha in Qatar, which has a lot of inherent interest. Then you have, uh, that's Mushireb again, um, with, with a very innovative approach to the treatment of urban streets. So bringing, creating mechanisms to create a greater sense of community in streets that were otherwise somewhat barren and, and uh, devoid of um, 
a sense of connectivity. Um, then um, KCAP, Case Christian Say, the Dutch, famous Dutch master planner, Hafen City in Hamburg, converting the former, the docks area of Hamburg, um, to a multi, a mixed use environment where, where all kinds of socially convivial activities can take place. And um, OMA, Skolkovo in Russia, but principally I write about OMA's projects in Japan, in, sorry, in China. And uh, I look a lot at the third world. I look a lot in particular at Latin America um, for reasons to do with the fact that I think it's part of the DNA of um, master planning in cities like Sao Paulo that they're very concerned with social equity and improving the lot of the poor to uh, somehow e close, close the gap between, in terms of um, uh, the provision between the richer and the poorer, because these are very polarized communities. And I do actually really believe that there's a lot to be gained from analyzing um, Latin American master plans of that kind, because we have social polariz polarization in London, and the riots this summer were a very, very dramatic demonstration of the, the somehow the tensions inherent in, in the polarization that exists in, in our society. This is um, 10, Enrique Norton's um, wonderful master plan, which is waiting for um, uh, some extra finance for Chokimilco, which is an a environmentally de degraded area of Mexico City on the outskirts, which is are going to be an area for it already has got sports facilities and existing market and it's quite a touristic area as well. And then, um, what's that one? Um, um, MVRDV, Winnie Mas and his team are MVRDV's um, Almira, um, work in Almira, which is the city which is to the east of Amsterdam, which has had a lot of different master plans in the past, but the current one, which is waiting again for the Dutch government to raise its own level of confidence in its, the, the economic situation to go ahead with the next stage. That, I think, is a very, a very interesting project because increasingly people can't afford to live in Amsterdam and they have to live in, in, in nearby city. And so it makes sense not to see Elmira as a poor cousin or a dormitory town, but to somehow strengthen its, its cultural amenity and its, and its resources. Um, then, um, this is also, uh, this is also um, Elmira. Um, of course, I've been wading through wading through uh, lots and lots of really beautiful, seductive renders of future master plans, because the reality is that what I'm talking about, they are largely, they are, they are speculative projects. They've been commissioned, but they have not yet been realized. So I've got photographs in the book of real places, but the actual master planning dot graphic material is, is quite varied, but it obviously includes the the stock in trade of all urban designers, which is beautiful, um, alluring plans, uh, images like that. Um, an enormous master plan by Zaha Hadid architects for the Kartal Pendik area on the east, uh, Asian, the Asian side of Istanbul, um, which has very, very complex land ownership. And uh, they are, the, the local municipality is gradually doing deals with the different uh, developers or different landowners in order to establish a big enough portion of land to, um, to actually go ahead with at least phase one of it. Um, then we have um, Constitucioni in um, Chile, which was hit by earthquake and tsunami. Um, Elemental, um, who's the practice is, which is based in Santiago. Now Elemental are one of the younger architectural groups who have not done much in the way of master planning in the past, but they have a superb approach. And you probably read if, about Elemental's strategies for housing, working with quite low, uh, the, the, the low budgets for affordable housing that, that they get given and finding a very uh, clever way through, through making and designing half the house and then allowing, facilitating through the design, the um, owners to actually 
um, build at their leisure or get a grant to build the other house, half of the house. So it becomes, let's say, a, a more bespoke, customized solution and um, then raising the value of the house in the, in the long term, but somehow still staying within the budget. Um, and their strategic approach is incredibly lucid, I think. That's also them. Um, then also um, Medellin in Colombia, Alejandro Echeverri, who is a um, master planner and, a, and an architect, working with the well, really with the local council, but with a new agent, a newer agency that was set up to, to undertake and implement a lot of improvements to the city of Medellin, which um, Bogota in Colombia has had its problems, but Medellin had a very, very high level of, um, of crime, both drug, drug traffic, trafficking and um, high level of murders. And since the implement, implementation of the master planning initiatives, things have hugely improved. I will talk about that in a, in a little while. I'm gonna, what I will do is, is to just run through these, the, the rest of these key examples, and then I'll tell you a few, few stories about a few of the projects. Then um, Westgate, the Dutch landscape architects and master planners, who've done the most wonderful, uh, let's say, kind of uh, assemblage of connected parks um, to, let's say, regenerate the, the riverbanks um, in, uh, um, in Madrid, um, connecting uh, what was a very down at hill set of two neighborhoods to the rest of the city, knitting, knitting them together. And that has been actually completely finished last April with, with new, uh, some new bridges as well. Um, and, and also, still on the younger architectural side, um, Metro Grammar, who are our Italian practice um, based in Milan, who have been leading the very major urban development plan commissioned by the local mu the municipality, which is ongoing, um, which I will talk about in a little bit. And, um, and then uh, Copenh Copenhagen, when I did my research, research trip there, I realized that there were um, at least 25 different master plans ongoing at, at any one time for different parts of the city. And I, um, I had a huge problem to decide which, one, which ones I should focus on because I couldn't possibly write about all of them. So I chose three. And one is the old industrial site, the old Carlsberg Berg site in the city center which is being master planned by Entasis, who are a young, young practice. <coughs> so, um, so um, also the total impossibility of being comprehensive, um, what I've done is I've clustered the th plans around different themes, so you have, and these, you probably will agree, these are pretty interdependent categories, you can't really, um, see them as totally isolated from one another. You've got um, post-industrial and post-military uh, districts of cities, so Huffen City being uh, very much um, post-industrial. Um, um, there is also, let's say, in, uh, in a city like Istanbul, um, where um, young architects in particular lose out because um, developers tend to work very much with engineers when it comes to master planning and take a rather, rather uh, abstract or let's say technical, technically driven approach rather than going for something more interesting and conceptual that picks up something of, the, let's say, the cultural realities of the city, which is a real pity. So you get plans which are really ignoring the topography of the city, and Istanbul, as you know, is very, has wonderfully, uh, you know, hilly environment. Um, but when I went to a conference for Urban Age, uh, staged by the LSE in, uh, 
in Istanbul. They commissioned super pool architects to just basically make a master planning proposal for reusing um, car parking structures in a particular area of the city to free up the streets um, to, to somehow find new, u new uses for them. So I think one message of my book is that something very, very, you know, micro planning, something quite small, can be retrofitted in a very imaginative way with the right strategy. Um, and uh, is even more, you know, just as valid now, more valid now than ever before. Um, New Orleans definitely is post-disaster, I think you would agree. Um, that's a whole essay in the book. Um, that, uh, then we have, so beyond the retrofitting, then you've got science, technology and cultural districts. Um, one north, one north in, in Singapore, which is a Zaha Hadid master plan, which has got at least its stage, stage phase one completion already. And in fact, it was one of Zaha Hadid's first master plans and it proved to a lot of people that she actually, her practice had great, you know, great strength in, in, in their ability to master plan. And she got a lot of new commissions on the strength of it, including Cartel Pendic. Um, then um, obviously you can imagine the eco-city category is very important, eco-cities and towns. For example, Monte Corvo, which is a district on the edge of um, uh, Lagrono in, in northern Spain, which is an MVRDV commission. And then um, a big category, which is landscape and landscape infrastructure driven plans. And this is Ground Lab who um, are based in London and Beijing, Ground Lab's plan for Longgang in, in China, which is a, a wonderful uh, strategy. Um, more of that. And they seem to find uh, the knack to counter the, the, the prevailing um, trend, which is to just follow that fast track urbanization that the Chinese are very keen on. And they have found a way to privilege natural landscape and also to preserve the notion of urban villages in such a way that they maintain not in a sort of like in aspect the old you know model of old town or old village like it's sort of reproduction but they somehow will analyze the form of a village and and recreate it within the context of a, lands a landscape uh, driven uh, master plan and i think those two strategies have huge validity now um, more of uh, their, their plans for the project, uh, re using relational urban modeling quite a lot as well. Um, and of course, um, Madrid Rio by West State is a classic example of a, lands a landscape uh, design in driven master plan. Um, and uh, urban, urban think tank proposition for Hoograven in the Netherlands. Again, privileging landscape. And plans incubating social equity, of course, as I mentioned before, through the transformation of public space. So Hoograven actually fits two categories. It's landscape driven, but it's also very much about social equity. Um, working with um, communities that are largely based on immigrants within the Netherlands um, to find a credible solution. And then this one is Michael Hart, who's an architect based in Johannesburg. His proposition for Lion Park, which is the, um, let's say, the retrofitting of a township in Johannesburg into a more mixed use and a mixed income, a mixed income um, entity. Um, which is very much um, something that he feels is necessary. He's fighting against a lot of conservatism in thinking in, in, uh, in amongst the planners in, in South Africa, where they're paying lip service to post-apartheid thinking, but the reality is they're still planning master plans as if, let's say, the car is king, disregarding the fact that the actual demographics of the people on the ground, not very many people can actually afford cars. So you actually, you want walkable environments, walkable communities. You want um, a very palpable sense of small grain, fine grained uh, community space as uh, that 
that, that image gives a little bit of an indication of. Um, and then what's that? Oh yes, not forgetting Australia. I went to Brisbane a few years ago. Um, Brisbane um, fits into the category of plans for urban growth because Michael Hart, who designed the Karulpa Bridge in the city, went to the mayor of the city one day and he said, look, I think the city needs to go this way. We need to connect up all the different districts um, and have more precincts, which are a very kind of a unique phenomenon in, in Australia. Um, precincts meaning kind of mixed-use de mixed districts in the city where you have residential but also shopping and le uh, leisure activities. And um, he didn't ask for any money, he just asked for some time to be listened to. And then after three years, they took his took his plan on, and he's a kind of local hero now. That's his bridge. Um, and that's just one of the millions of um, <laughs> plans that he sent to me to show me the, the kind of essence of his thinking, of uh, thinking about connecting, because the river itself is already very serpentine, but there are so many routes that you want to still facilitate because there are a lot of people who cycle in Brisbane and, you, and he really felt that it was necessary to open up greater permeability of routes for cyclists. So, relational urban models again. Um, um, let me think. I was going to say that, um, obviously, these days, um, Simulating complex systems through dynamic advanced design techniques like parametric scripting and um, agent-based modeling, it's much more, they're much more widely used than ever before um, to facilitate lots of different options, to emphasize differentiation and to imbue urban space with a sense of, of fluidity akin to natural systems. Um, Ground Lab, as I referred to before, their plan for Longgang in China, it mixes functions with different programs and, and combines land uses. And I think they would not work without these tools, but they do, do it in a very kind of mature and conscientious way, and that's no substitute for on-the-ground research. So I think the point that I'm making is that there's the digital, and it's a very potent set of... Um, of uh, tools that we have, but the analog, which is you going out into the city and doing your own on the ground research with a you know pad of paper and markers and talking to people and having community workshops and so on, is equally necessary and that that master, conceptual master planning that has any great worth today in a way actually combines the best of those those methodologies. Um, there we have a community a charrette actually. I, um, in the States. Um, um, young architects are, um, I, I call this word edu edutainment, um, education and entertainment, but they do seem to really relish um, devising urban games about the city, either to make exhibitions out of them. This is uh, not Monopoly, it's called Polopoly for some reason. It was a show that uh, AOC, the British practice, devised where you, you, know, you step onto a one-to-one -one Monopoly board. Um, rather than playing SimCity computer game, you actually enter into a physical space and start thinking about real, real urban dilemmas. It's just one way in which the whole, uh, let's say, all the complex um, issues and parameters that you are confronted with and have to make sense of and help inform your design can, can actually be, of, uh, can be creative. So that's a little bit of um, urban think tank again. But um, the next thing I was going to say is that I think that... Um, the fact that we live with a digital, almost like it's sort of breathing, a uh, breathing thing, um, it, this has made urban plans um, much more transparent as phenomena because via website con documentation and public blogs, but also through the existence of proliferating mechanisms, we have manipulable, manipulable lenses for, um, through which to view and investigate the world. For example, um, 
a few years ago, Google Earth didn't exist, did it? Um, and now we have the green map systems, which are used by environmentalists around the world to document green spaces, biking paths, endangered habitats, and more. Um, there's also the phenomenon of walking uh, world mappers, world mappers, I don't have an image for them, but um, walking papers, which is on the screen, you can actually call up maps of any city in the world and annotate them and have them sent to you. So that's, there's a huge uh, potential for customizing maps um, and use them as, let's say, um, use them as your own personal framework for, for, for uh, your own perception of what needs to be done. World Mappers is another web, a webzine, a website, where you can feed in data about numerous global economic factors, from population growth through to energy use, and produce the maps revealing disparities between the developed world and the developing world. Um, I was going to say this site is actually, it's a little, it has free geographic data and it's a little bit like a wiki style open street maps. So you can update it online. You don't need to print it out, but you can actually have a, an online version of what you've done, personalizing locations. And it's been used in, in the last two years for humanitarian relief efforts, like in Haiti. It's also been used in disenfranchised areas, which have a real lack of on-the-ground information um, to help lobby for changes to urban in infrastructure. Um, so uh, really quite a vital, a vital um, resource, I think, that didn't exist a, a few years ago. So um, just um, thinking back about the back in time of a few classic master plans um, and why they were somehow very strangely lacking in all the necessary things. I mean, the, uh, it does help, I think, when thinking about what you should do now. But Historically, the city of Brasilia was built in only four years, and last April it celebrated its 50th anniversary. But while its um, individual buildings by Niemeyer and da Costa are, are really liked, its barren public spaces are really not liked. They are free of um, any, any green leaves, they are arid, and they have very little shade. So ecologically, they're, um, they're dreadful. To, to, to be a tourist in, unfortunately, and to have, have a relaxed time. And then the late city, the late modernist city of Chandigarh in the Punjab in India, well, it was an integrated total city vision of Le Corbusier's. Um, and it had massive, a massive impact, but as um, more people are moving to Chandigarh because it's quite a, a quite a center of new technologies. So you have a lot, a lot of very young people living there and studying there and working there. Um, they have built, built up a number, a couple of satellite towns. And the satellite towns um, have the councils of Pan, Pankula and Mohabi, Mohali, sorry, have absorbed population and industry growth. But they, so they maintain the structure of Chandigarh um, but um, they have shed all the ordinances of the Chandigarh um, in terms of ideology. So the streets have become very mixed use. And um, I met a team from TU Technical University in Berlin who'd studied this phenomenon. And they said they were amazed at how little dialogue there had been between the councils of Chandigarh and, the, and the local, these local satellite towns. And it is very true that in India, one thing that's very developer-driven is the, um, these townships, which are really kind of luxury developments. They're very like closed enclaves, and the architecture is very slick, but not very good. And um, there have been psychological studies saying that people, children growing up there, um, uh, if when they leave, they feel quite confused when they go, and, could go to a city like Delhi because they're living in such a rarefied environment and they don't have exposure to the wide mix of people in cities. That, so there's somehow you're very protected, which might be good, and it's probably very safe, very safe, but it's also a very, very 
uh, limited kind of environment that you're there. And you have to question whether that's a good idea or not. But unfortunately, the developers have great power in India at the moment. But a, a lot of people disapprove of, of them. So maybe the forces will, it, maybe there will be a movement towards um, cutting back on them. Um, the other one, of course, that we remember probably if you've been to Berlin is that the, um, is, uh, uh, um, the, um, the center of Potsdamer Platz, which was master planned by Renzo Piano. Um, adding a lot of very corporate buildings. But the, the, the real drawback that most people agree on is that there is really very con little connectivity to the local uh, residential districts. So one step, two steps forward, three steps, four steps back. So a real drawback in that sense. Um, so I think we need, um, a new, we need a new sense of strategies, and I think that adaptive planning, and here's um, a little diagram showing MVRDV's work in Almiri, which is um, very much about, uh, let's say, some of the districts actually involve multiple architects all working together in a particular area, each designing um, housing. So as many as... Um, yeah, over 30 different practices working together. It seems very idealistic, but in Almiri there is actually a strong tradition not only of self-house building by individual people, but also of these collaborative teams that you don't get in maybe in a city like, in a city like London. So, um, So I'm going, to, I'm going to move on quickly to um, Milan, um, which, is a, which is a project that, um, which is a city that has um, increasing numbers of skyscrapers. Um, an area of Milan called Santa Giulia, which was um, going to be a grand scheme uh, by Foster with a green lung, a green, big green park up on the top left uh, of, the, of the image by West Date. Um, it was really developed by Rosanamento, the developers, but without any other, with state, state funds because of the, the lack, of, lack of government money. And um, it's been developed and had to be abandoned because Rosanamento had to basically sell the site. And so you can see on the right-hand side how it so far turned out. Um, and the different images of, let's say, the idealism and the reality of drop in price of the apartments because very few people actually want to live there. But Milan has a hugely, um, yeah, that's the really depressing reality that was all over Italian newspapers a short while ago. Um, but Milan has had a huge desire to, and, and is moreover, retrofitting and, and adapting its post-industrial neighborhoods. You know, Milan being the city of the car industry, Fiat and so on. Um, and the, I interviewed the deputy mayor of Milan, Carlo Mazzaroli, about their urban development plan. He um, um, came up with an incredibly integrated plan, which was as much about finding new, me new economic mechanisms for individual districts and their social provision, um, public a, more, a more sensible use of public services than in the past. Um, but it's also a very light, enlightened plan. It's very multifaceted, so it took an awful long time to get to the bottom of it because, um, how can I describe it briefly? Um, just simply, if you see all those, those um, um, uh, embryonic forms, um, the overall development plan is based on an intense mapping which it led to devising 88 new, new neighborhoods, um, um, redefining Milan as a networked lattice array in place of the traditional hub and spoke um, uh, format. Or for the, there, was a, there were previously nine administrative zones built up over centuries that um, the team felt no longer, no longer meaningfully uh, reflected local local identities. So it's almost as if you take all the boroughs in London and you decide you're going to have not that many boroughs, you're going to have like hundreds of smaller villages. 
I think that just the way you re-represent the city in that way can be very powerful. Um, so areas like Bovisa um, have been, you know, they're, they're more, let's say, seen as um, part of a more permeable network interconnecting the whole city. Um, Areas like Garibaldi Repubblica in Milan, which is part of the Porta Nuova plan, which reunites three adjacent neighborhoods, adding a large park to become one, one of the city's intermodal hubs. Um, and then um, something that actually was kicked off quite a long time ago and has now, been in re has now actually been integrated into the urban development plan um, land, who are an Italian-German landscape practice um, uh, based in, in Milan, actually, came up with a very clever scheme called Raggi Verdi, which is 72 metre long network of foot and bicycle paths leading through eight green rays, so Raggi Verdi is green rays, um, starting from the centre of Milan and ending in the suburbs. And, um, the Andreas Kipper from Land, he, he is very much an advocate of landscape-driven urbanism, and he believes that um, landscape replaces architecture as the basic build, building block of contemporary urbanism. That's quite radical. He says, urbanism is completely inseparable from living systems. Um, Living systems are not purely a recreational relief or a visual amenity, but they are completely integrated and embedded within the city. Um, so there, there are a number of them, as you could see on that plan, and um, there's a lot of detail here, so I'm going to skip, skip. But he, so Puerto Nuova obviously is one very key, key one, Raggi Verdi number one, um, northeast of the Duomo. And there's such a lot of disused land in Milan, you see, so it's left empty after changes in the railway system, particularly at Garibaldi. Um, and um, one needs to have a vision for them. And one needs also to consider the needs of cyclists. So there's been an awful lot of work done on permeability, again, as in Brisbane, for the, for the cyclists. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing to rein in the Italian car drivers in Milan, but I think that's quite an entrenched phenomenon, unfortunately, in lots of cities to actually encourage people to stop using their cars so much. But um, there are some wonderful pictures that Lan sent me of these incredibly um, beautiful contexts of, you know, um, the city. And um, just concluding on, on, uh, on Milan, I would say that it's all the more interesting that this is happening and very good that they may have taken this stand right now in the face of so many economic pressures because Milan Expo 2015 is starting, it is already um, pl in planning and its theme is Feeding the Planet, Energy for Life. And it's, it's got its own radical master plan. It's going to be held in the area of Rho Perro in the north of Milan. Um, and it's a radical plan for land use, which has been drawn up by people like Herzog and de Meron and, and, um, and others. And it redefines urban rural um, interaction in the form of an array of greenhouses and farmland where each pavilion can grow its own crops. Um, you can see there on the screen. Um, and it includes a legacy plan, as we have with our London Olympic legacy plan, to join um, up with the 40, 47,000 hectare Parco Agricolo Sud and a network of existing farms. So this is being perceived as a productive landscape, landscape ethos um, that is all part of the, the agency of the Urban Development Plan. So I think, you know, are we talking about what is a contemporary 21st century utopia? I think this is it. Um, I think this is very generative, it's very productive. It's not the old modernist utopian vision of tabula rasa, which is, you know, get rid of everything and impose some uh, formal morphology. 
um, with a very, very uh, major kind of do-gooding ideology, but this is something that everyone hopefully can feel that they have a part of. It also emphasizes a certain degree of self-sufficiency, but in a benign way rather than, um, rather than um, saying, right, you're out on your own and you do what you, what you can. Um, how are we doing for time? We're running a little bit short of time now. How, Will, how much time do we have? I've got a couple more stories, but I could make it one story if, it, if it's... Um... One story. Okay, well, the others are... Um... What's that one? Yeah, that's the, that's the beautiful material on Milan Ex Expo. Um, I think uh, probably what I will do since um, I'm... I've, Constitucione, the master plan in Chile, um, the master planner behind it, Alejandro Aravena, was in London the other day and gave a new lecture on the subject. So I, um, and it's also going forward because the government was very, very committed to it. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, but I'll just show you without comment the, um, the uh, material on, uh, on Medellin, which actually has been featured in the media an awful lot. So it would be quite easy for you to read up on it. Is it basically a concept of, uh, I mean, a wonderful array of improvements, but also devising lots of so-called library parks, so libraries in different, very, very uh, underprivileged neighborhoods, um, this one being in a, on the top of a very steep hill, um, and improving quality of local uh, co sense of community, um, <coughs> In incorporating a new light, well, a, a um, cable car system to get people to connect what were otherwise really, really, really isolated districts that were somehow they were cut off, they were subject to mur daily murders, there were curfews after 5 p.m. no one would go out. Um, the mayor, um, the, the mayor really managed within four years, which is an amazing, Sergio Fajardo, who was a, a, mathemat who's a mathematician who became the mayor, just took it on himself to, um, to galvanize through, through architecture the whole sort of fate of the city. Um, there's a few images of, of MVRDV's Monticorvo, which is, an, I would say, you could call it an eco-district rather than an eco-city because it's a district next to Logrono in northern Spain, um, which has been widely admired. And then at the same, it's also got, uh, you know, lots of plans for solar energy and so on. But it's also been discussed in the sense that people have said, well, okay, it's very ecologically advanced, but on the other hand, people who live there are going to feel rather isolated from the main city. They need to do something better to improve the connectivity with the city itself. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll go through Constitutione very, very quickly because um, it's a pretty important one. And I would say that um, it's Chile's second city. Um, it's 350 kilometers south of Santiago. It's a seaside resort with, with a high dependency on um, fishing industry as well. And the fishermen have long since lived by the by the water, and it's at the mouth of the River Mall in the Pacific Ocean. And so it was hit in um, uh, February, not this year, but last year, by um, a, a massive 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake and subsequent tsunami. And 550 people were killed, and over 2 million people, 80% were left homeless. Um, this is obviously nothing like the scale of what's happened, the tragedy in Japan. But the plan for the cities are nonetheless of great value.
for understanding how seismically vulnerable areas can be reinvented with the full consultation of their communities. So most of the collapsed buildings, um, about 70% of all the buildings in the city were collapsed, and they, in, including a lot of historic structures. They weren't new and they weren't necessarily very notable architecturally, but they, and they were made actually largely of adobe mud, sun-dried mud. Um, so reconstruction, they reckoned, would take three to four years, um, said the president. And so immediately they set up a public-private alliance to develop the master plan. And it was actually driven by um, uh, a, wood, uh, um, a wood company, a uh, timber, timber firm that worked in forestry called Aralco, a private company with the, with the right kind of socially enlightened vision to really get things moving. So they commissioned Elemental. Elemental have their great reputation as a think-and-do tank. And they said, um, they said we've got, you've got 100 days to come up with a scheme, um, which meant that they had to go in and assimilate a lot of information very quickly. They had to have, on one hand, design ideas uh, with public consultation, so with the support of the community. They had to design the mechanisms for its implementation. So there was no real time to plan in an abstract way, but that's actually to its, to in its favor that they didn't. They had to consult the people and then work out what to do very quickly. So the idea was not to recover what was there before the earthquake and the tidal wave, to make a new city under comprehensive perspective. Um, so they divide, divided it into four areas, so infrastructure, public areas, um, 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 and their resources, housing and energy. And um, housing and energy, and you can see the state of the extent of the devastation. And um, create plans also within that 100 days for and the desi detailed designs for a new cultural center, school, fire station, river park, tourist boardwalk, and cycle paths as well. So bus station, municipal theater, I mean everything, markets, shipbuilders, yard, children's playgrounds, pedestrian bridge, and so on. Um, so the idea was to really rebuild all the resources that had been destroyed. Um, and so how did they come up with, along with all that complexity, um, some, some solution to make it anti-tsunami? Now in Japan and in other um, areas hit by these, these disasters, they've used a lot of concrete concrete um, infrastructure, which is, looks horrible and is actually not that effective. Um, and instead, what Elemental did was to come up with a new coastal park, um, to, which shifts the axis of the city anyway to the waterfront, capitalizing on its natural and functional assets and giving it a new river access. It was a park with a forest, um, and it is something that um, really uses nature to fight nature. And that sounds like a very trite way of, or maybe a too easy solution. But uh, the way they devised the, 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 the area, uh, let's say around the, around the coast, it, it, it did in fact um, seem that this was ecologically the best, um, best solution. Um, they also researched what people wanted in terms of a new urban aesthetic. They came up with the idea that, in fact, people didn't necessarily want their old mud adobe houses at all. They didn't want something too slick. So they came up with something which referred to the tradition of, traditional, uh, tradition of the Chilean row house. Um, there's a lot of roads here. And, touristic areas. They, they also tried to build as much of the housing close to the river because there would have otherwise been pressures to recite all the fishermen way, way, way from the coast in order to protect them. But on the other hand, that would have been useless for them because they needed to be close to the water for their livelihood. Um, so what they did was to come up with a lot of lightweight buildings on salt walk areas where you're somehow you're in the building they're a little bit permeable between the inside and the outside 
very modern, but without being overwhelming in that particular context. They also devised a program of these consultations, and they set up an open house center um, and uh, invited citizens in um, to give them an ongoing commentary on what was happening and ask for their feedback. And then they asked them all to vote. So they had to vote in these hybrid for forums about different aspects of the plan. And in the end, 94% decided that they were in favor of it. But they all went to vote, and none, none of them had ever done anything quite like this before. Um, and then the, Ministry of, the Minister of Housing um, was so pleased with both the, the actual design, the concept, the whole process of consultation, which Elemental themselves devised, they designed that, that she said that really this was something that was a template for, for future developments in other parts of Chile, um, which is a great vote of confidence. Um, so um, Elemental, they learned to think of the emergency and the contingency as incremental actions that were fast and they were improvable. So, um, there's, there's no urban reconstruction process in the world that can be undertaken in shorter than three years. But on the other hand, they have to create permable, so permanent, permanent and, and professional solutions that are coordinated, integrated, and flexible. Um, Alejandro Aravena said the most precious ability and, and skill was the ability to coordinate. He said it's not about being asked to do a design, but to come up moreover with the deeper questions that need to be solved. So I think that's a, you know, a very good mature assessment of, um, of what you do in an in emergency when you're, you're not just um, devising how to get water to people and how to give them emergency shelters, but you are actually faced with having to really be rebuild everything from the ground upwards. So um, just by way of As you can see, this is um, such a massive project. It's very, very hard to <laughs> condense the stories and all the details into, um, into a very short period of time. Um, and also all the material, the wealth of material. Um, so 16 years ago, there was this famous book, SML XL, written by Rem Koolhaas. And he identified the paradox that urbanism as a profession disappeared at the moment when urbanization everywhere was on its way to global triumph. Um, he talked about a new urbanism that involved creating of enabling fields that accommodate processes that refer, refuse to be crystallized into definitive form. Um, instead, they were about expanding notions, denying boundaries, um, not about separating or, or identifying identifying entities, but they were about discovering unnameable hybrids. Now, Rem Koolhaas always says everything with a little um, bit of sense of humor, quite ir ironic. Um, and what is an unnameable hybrid, for goodness sake? But I do really see what he's getting at. And um, it also does seem like a long time that he wrote that. And even longer time ago that Jane Jacobs, the famous um, author of, um, of that classic book about death and life of Amer great American cities, who is so much an advocate for quality, quality community spatial environments, um, wrote her book in 1961. Now, and she was always battling against planning lunacies. I mean, they were really battling in those days the, the very severe effects of modernist planning and they were out on the streets all the time um, uh, campaigning against it. So um, what do we have now? Um, we, have <laughs> we have a lot because we have incredible resources in the intellectual and practical skills of architects and urban designers, um, such as the ones that I've shown, who have, a, a, I think, a good grasp of, of the challenges and the issues. But I think we have to be aware that the terminology we use is quite subjective. And um, our mayor, Boris Johnson, he, he's very, very jokey, of course. And he said, um, the city was the single most brilliant invention of our species. Um, he said, 
he recommends that at all time we have to keep on putting the village back into the city. Now, what we can speculate, what on earth does he mean by that? Um, what village? Does he mean a sort of only one type of person or one time of income? And I think, obviously, he's a very public-minded guy. He hopefully, hopefully means um, um, everybody. But, I mean, he is conservative and he has also backtracked on lots of commitments. Um, and he also believes that um, wealth should trickle down. Um, when he was taken on, take, when he uh, was campaigning for mayor, he said, we mustn't do anything to dissuade the richest people from coming, coming to London. We should um, um, let them come and then imagine that the money that they have and the resources will trickle down to help benefit the quality of communities. And I mean, now in this day and age, I think everyone is rather hoping that, that the social philanthropists in the city will do more to, to, to help the quality of life because we do, in our city, we still do have an awful lot of, a lot of challenges to do with quality of community space and community resources. Um, so, um, how can I uh, just uh, sum this up? You can see the, um, the worst planning award ever. People, I mean, are very quick to come up with what they think is bad, but the, the, the challenge is to analyze and to, to, to define things that are actually good. So I think that um, you, you want the capacity to go beyond abstract plans, go beyond generic, you know, something that you think is so fun and appropriate, you can put it into any, any cultural context in the world, because that could be just as banal as having um, um, McDonald's in every city centre in the world and, and, no, and no more. It doesn't actually analyse or come to terms with realities. So I think the, the plans need to be bespoke in the sense that if you go and get a, a suit made, um, it's bespoke. It's actually designed for your body and nobody else's. And so it needs to be designed for your community and not someone else's be, as I said, adaptable, responsive, flexible, incremental, because developers say now they want to be incremental, because if they're not, um, they go bust, because Canary Wharf, when Canary Wharf was first opened, the developers went bust, because they tried to do it all at once, and they were so stretched financially that it just overwhelmed them. So the developers of King's Cross Central Master Plan, Argent, told me most firmly there was no way they were going to go bust because don't worry, we're going to do it in stages. Um, but I do also mean incremental in terms of having a very clear sense of what you want to do at each stage and being sufficiently flexible in, my, in, your, in your overall concept so you can adapt it at every stage of the way. You can't be too pre determined at the, these days. You can't be too prescriptive. I think, in essence, you base a good master plan, conceptual master plan, is based on sound principles. It's not, it could be, there could be certain rules, but ultimately the principles are the most important thing. Um, so I hope that's given you a little taste of um, some of the ideas in the book. Um, we, uh, it's a bit exhausting at the moment because we're just going crazily in the direction of going to production. So I had to put the latest material together quite quickly, but I hope that's given you a good taster of things to come. Thank you for listening. Yes, of course. What there is now, I don't have that much in the way of cycle.